testimony. And, and certainly, I, 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 do, I never thought of it as a sacrifice for somebody to do the will of God. That's the only way to get the blessings is to do the will of God. It's the place of blessing is to be right there, smack dab in the center of God's will. And I am so glad that you do not consider it a sacrifice, even though we can look at it and say, do you realize they sacrificed some of the uh, comforts of home? And, uh, but can I say, oh, one day, when these ones will end up uh, hearing him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I hope we can all say that. We can all hear him say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. And we say, thank you, Lord, but I didn't do anything. I was just an unprofitable servant. Unprofitable. Everything I did, I wasn't worthy of nothing you've done for me. How can I repay him for what he's done for us? We're in the book of 1 Corinthians today. 1 Corinthians, and it is going to be my Christmas message. And uh, we're going to look at God's gracious gift, the gift of grace. God's gracious gift, the gift of grace. So I'm going to pray and then we will read the scriptures and get into the message. Father, I do thank you again for the privilege of being in the house of God today. Lord, we know that thou art God and you don't need us. You've chosen us as vessels. To be vessels unto honor, sanctified and meet for the Master's use. Lord, you've given us this opportunity today to be in the house of God. Now, Lord, I pray, God, that we would glorify you in our body, in our spirit, which will belong today. Where we are yours, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Now, Father, I pray that you would help us this morning in the preaching time. And Lord, I pray you give us ears to hear what the Spirit says this morning. Lord, to this church and to all that call upon the name of the Lord in every place. Lord, for those here that are not part of this particular church, but God, they are part of your peculiar body. Now, Lord, I pray you bless in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are looking today in 1 Corinthians. We'll read the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sophonies, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord of Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ. That in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind and know him, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called under the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, thank you for the word. Now, Lord, let us accomplish all our will, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians. It is the first letter that is addressed to a particular church. Romans is to the saints at Rome. I've said it last week, and I've said it many times before, I do not know how many churches were in Rome, but he only did not address it to a particular church in Rome, but he did to this one here a particular church. And so we find that he is dealing with a particular people, the church of God, which is at Corinth. A church is an assembly called for congregation. And we find that he's writing because of the love of the church. He said, the church of God. 
This church loves God and God loves His church. And do not ever uh, think lightly of this church because they were God's church in Corinth. Many would say as they read through this letter, boy, they were a mess. But I would ask you to look at your own self. Examine yourself and see, are you not a mess? Do you not mess up? Do you not have problems? We find the love of the church. We find the location of the church at that Corinth. And we find the lifestyle of the church. They're sanctified in Christ Jesus. That is their position. They are set apart unto God. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. Not only do we find they're sanctified in Christ Jesus as their position, but they're saintly. They're called to be saints. That is to be their practice. They're called to be what they are. I said this all throughout the book of Romans and I dealt with the book of Romans. Called to be saints does not mean that He's calling you unto salvation, but He's calling you to be what you are. You already are beloved of God. You're already sanctified unto God. But now he says live it. And let me say, that is the problem. Many a time is in our churches is there is no life living out what we are. They're pressing to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's written to you that particular people. But it's written for all that are in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Written to a particular people and written for a peculiar people. All that call upon the name in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. It seems to be an open letter to help all the churches and church people concerning church problems. And let me say, this book deals with church problems. It specifically deals with Corinth to teach as much about the people, about pride, and about problems. But those same problems, that same pride, and those same people are in churches all over America and around the world. He is writing to these people. So it's written to Christians who congregate. That's a church. He's not just writing to a general group of people. He is not writing to a mystical body. He is writing to a particular, peculiar people. And we must remember that. So when he writes this letter, there's three things in the beginning of his book dealing with this particular peculiar people, and that is there's prayer, there's praise, and then there's problems. And he starts this book out after he introduces himself and introduces whom he's writing to with prayer. And we will deal with that today. You'll notice verse 3. Grace be unto ye, and peace from God our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer. I would say this. That's the only place you're ever going to get grace. And that's the only place you're going to get peace. Is from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was not saying, let me give you my grace. Let me give you my peace. He is not imputing to them these things, but he's praying for them these things. That God will pour out grace and peace on these ones. Then we find there's praise. And we see that in verses 4 through 6. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ, or by Jesus Christ. That in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come behind no gift. I notice this. That he is not praising the people. But he is praising the person of God. 
And let me say, for God is the one who gives grace. Which brings us to our title. The gracious gift. The gift of grace. And it comes by Jesus Christ. But then throughout the whole rest of the book, we find there are problems. There are problems. And let me say, I have not found a church yet that does not have problems. And I find the two problems, two categories of problems in, in this book. And what I mentioned those last week as I, as I, I preached on uh, uh, Paul and the determination. And uh, I dealt with that last week as he was determined uh, not to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But I, I mentioned these two problems. There's prideful divisions and there's personal debate. Prideful divisions. And you will find that in verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And we'll not deal with those problems today. But I will tell you this. The only solution for problems in the church is the grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The only solution. So if you are looking for solutions to your problems, we must look to the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. For I realize that every church needs these two things that can only be divinely delivered. They need grace. And they need peace. Grace is the gift of God to gain salvation. It is also the gift of God to grow in salvation. Grace is a gift of God. You did not earn it. It is unmerited faith. Matter of fact, God even started this operation out for the goodness of God that leadeth in repentance. You didn't start this thing and you'll not finish it. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who brought grace to us. The grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to all men. It's all by grace. As that one songwriter said, all of grace is my story. All the way from earth to glory. Since by grace he lifted me from sin and woe. Living grace he has extended since on him my heart depended. And there will be new grace when it's time, when it's my time to go. Grace. Grace, marvelous grace. And then there's peace. It's the gift of God that's brought at salvation. And it's also a gift that we receive as we live out his salvation. We get peace with God through our Lord and Jesus Christ at the moment of salvation. But can I say, we'll get more peace when we go through troubles as we grow and we live out this salvation. I'll say this about this. These gifts are the delivery work of the Holy Spirit as He does the determined will of the Father through the delightful wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the delivering work of the Spirit of Christ in us. And if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, that is the Holy Spirit. He's none of His. The whole Godhead is involved in His giving us grace. It's the will of God. He'd not have any, he'd have, he would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants every one of us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the will of God. And we find it in the delightful wonder of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And to think about, especially this time of year, as uh, the wonder of wonders, oh, how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me? Oh, how can we even think when we look at that babe in a manger, when we consider him, it was a wonder. But it was that God could pour out his grace, give us grace to help in our time of need. Paul prayed for these ones that did have this divine grace and this divine peace. He prayed for this church. And he prayed for all of us that are in Christ Jesus that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He prayed this for us. And let me say, we ought to pray this for those around the world. We ought to pray for our, what we call our sister churches, those who are like-minded, those that we fellowship with. And not only for them, for all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We ought to be praying, God, give them grace and give them peace. Let me say this, grace comes before peace. I look throughout the Bible, and every place that both words are used in a, in a verse, it's always grace and then peace. It's never peace and then grace. You say, why has it got to be grace before peace? Because there is no real peace until you experience grace. And let me say this. That being the case, peace is a work of grace. It's the outworking from grace. There is no peace without grace. So we're going to look at the gift of grace for just a few moments. We'll look at two things about grace. We'll find it. There's grace to gain salvation. And there's grace to grow in salvation. We know that's taught in Ephesians chapter 2. There's grace to gain salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you not realize that that grace and just like that faith both are given to us by God? Matter of fact, is it not what our verse says in, in our portion of Scripture we read? I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ. You did not get saved without it all being of grace. There's nothing else to it. It's grace. How do you say that? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart, soul to fear, and grace my fears relieved. I mean, is it not grace that started this whole thing out? Was it not grace that did the whole work? Now let me say, just so you do not think I am some kind of Calvinistic fatalist or some sort, I do believe it's all of grace, but I believe you have the responsibility to respond to that grace. And that all men, whosoever, could do so, if only they will. So he said, whosoever will, let them come. Let them come. But I do not want to dispute the art and argue with anybody it is all grace. Do not throw out the baby with the bathwater and try to make it a work of man. That's exactly what the Armenians do. The Armenian brethren will say, well, it's faith and grace plus work. But we learned in the book of Romans that they go about to establish their own righteousness not submit themselves to the righteousness of God. And if it's a grace, it's no longer works. But no longer, it's not a works. If it's a works, it's no longer a grace. It's all a grace. 
We're accepted in His presence by grace. Yeah, He calls them in Ephesians the riches of His grace. There's forgiveness by grace. There's redemption by grace. And it's all settled by grace. We're about grace right this side. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 2, tell us we stand by grace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In this grace where we stand, we stand by grace. Romans 3 and verse 24 tells us we're justified by grace. God brought salvation by grace. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What does that teach us? Grace teaches us our need for repentance. To live soberly, righteously, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That teaches us our need for repentance. Can I say you'd have never seen your need for repentance if it would not have been by grace? Grace worked to teach us to deny ungodliness. You know, this is what I want to get saved. We can go through, a, uh, go through the motions, get them to say prayers all day long. But when a person realizes they're a sinner, they've got to make a choice. Will I deny ungodliness and worldly love? Because no man can serve two masters. And if the Holy Ghost is working on them, He convinces them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, reproves them of those things. He shows them sin. What does He show them? Listen, you cannot have keep on going on in that same lifestyle, that same way, and say, I want God. I don't care how much you want to say, somebody can say, oh yes, I, all you got to do is say a prayer and believe. Repent. Accept your repentance. You should all like to prepare for like, likewise prayers. It's repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus. Deny ungodliness and worldly love. Grace teaches us. And to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace teaches us that there has to be a change. But not only does grace do that. But grace shows us this. Teaches us that there has to be a change. But there has to be a trust. Is that not what grace teaches us? We can look at those same verses over in Titus chapter 2. In those verses over in Titus chapter 2, he says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself and peculiar people's zealous and good works. There has to be a trust. And grace is what teaches us. Not only. Not only that we need to repent but that there has to be a trust. A trust. A trust in salvation. A trust in a full salvation. Looking for that blessed hope. And, gr and trust for a finished salvation. The glory superior of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace shows us all of that. And if it was not grace showing us that, then we'd be working it up and conjuring it up in our minds. And it would be just a mental ascent to something. But thank God that God granted us grace. Let me say this. We believe that through grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. No other way. Grace is the gift of God to gain salvation. And grace is the gift of God to grow in salvation. Now let me say, 
There's problems in the church at Corinth. And it must be addressed. They received the gift of grace to gain salvation, but we're not growing in that salvation. Let me put it to you this way. They, 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 they have, they're called babes in chapter 3 in verse number 1. He tells them, I could not speak to you. Could not speak to unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. You got saved, you gained salvation, but you're not growing in salvation. And as you first began in Christ Jesus, so walk ye in Him. It's all by grace and it's all by faith. They received to gain salvation, but we're not growing in salvation. Hebrews 5 deals with that same idea, that same uh, philosophy where when you, you tired out to be teacher, you have need that one teach you again would be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. The saddest thing about our churches today is not that they're full of lost people, But can I say, they're full of people that have never grown in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can find lost people all over the world, out on the streets. But when somebody has professed Christ and may possibly truly possess Christ, and we find out in the Bible that they do not grow in grace, but God has given them the grace. It's the gift of God by Jesus Christ. They had the right foundation, but it needed to be built up in the most holy way. The foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. But he said, let every man that depart, or every man that has his hope in him depart from iniquity. He tells us in our book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, for the foundation no man lay, but that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of our salvation. They had the right foundation, but they were not broken in their salvation. So he prayed for them to have grace. And he praises God Forgive me grace. And I want to look at this just for a few moments. The gift of grace. In verse number 4 of chapter 1, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you're enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I see three things here about God enriching and enabling these ones by grace. And let me say that's what grace does. It enriches and enables. Three things. He see, I can see it in our expression of grace. But not only in our expression of grace, but we, in, a, in our expression of Christ. But we've seen our expectation from Christ. 